Who, good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett with the inaugural uh, hangout of Med, the Med, uh, Med Gadget Hangout Channel. And tonight we have the honor of, of having Peter Chai, MD. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's doing a toxicology, toxicology fellowship in, uh, at UMass, and he's going to be talking about the use of Google Glass in, in toxicology. And we have a distinguished uh, members of the panel. And first we'll introduce the members of the panel and turn it over to Peter. So good evening, Fred. Hi guys, uh, live from Belgium, early in the morning here. Um, yeah, ready for another interesting uh, and awesome hangout as usual. Uh, really looking forward. Good evening, Fred. It was nice of you to get up at 3 in the morning in Belgium. And John? Hello, John, can you yes, yes, Yeah, 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 you got it. Thank you. Well, good evening from Los Angeles, California. It's 6 o'clock and it's still 99 degrees right now. It's hot out here. Well, welcome, John. And uh, Phil. Yes. Hello, a late arrival. How are you? Good to see you, Phil. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Phil Abraham. I'm founder of CloudFace. And we're trying to get um, the complex organizations within healthcare to face the cloud so that we can drive cost out, improve patient outcomes, and eliminate disparate systems. Yeah, and, and Phil put some small companies on the cloud. One of them was GE, another one was Domino's, one's Walmart, and one's Walgreens. So he has a little history with the cloud. And, <laughs> and, and Simon uh, dropped out, and we may have a few people. Uh, coming in at at, uh, at a later date, and uh, Peter, it's all yours. Welcome. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me, John. Again, um, so my name is Peter. I'm an emergency medicine physician, um, and I'm a medical toxicology fellow um, on my last year of my fellowship. And um, a lot of my research is focused on the use of wearable devices and remote biosensing to help us uh, improve patient care, especially in emergency medicine. Um, so I guess we're here to talk a little bit about glass and what we've done with it so far. Um, uh, uh, Peter, so, uh, Peter, could yeah. you move your camera uh, down a little bit? We're just seeing the bottom of your face. Oh, is that better? Uh, yeah, sorry to, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no. Okay, go ahead. So I, I can tell you guys briefly about what we did. We uh, recently published a paper in the Journal of Medical Toxicology as well as in JAMA Derm about the use of Google Glass in the emergency department for uh, two ideas. One was we, we did remote dermatology consults and then more recently uh, as a tox fellow uh, we've been seeing our poison patients remotely in our emergency department at UMass through glass um, with uh, our, our consult service. So uh, I think that's pretty exciting stuff. Um, but you know, I'll tell you quickly about the project and then I guess we can leave space open to discussion and questions and anything like that and I'm happy to hear from anyone else as well. Um, so kind of the premise of the whole thing is that there are very few medical toxicologists in the United States. Um, a lot of the work that we do is uh, through phone consults, so we hear verbal descriptions of patients who are poisoned and uh, we're forced to make a decision on you know what we do, what kind of antidote you want to treat them with. Um, you know, most of the times it's okay, but there there are very kind of subtle pieces of the physical exam and the history that uh, are related to poison patients that I, I think almost every night we're on call we have that feeling where we wish if we could only you know just see the patient you know that would really help us decide what we want to do um, and so that's kind of where we turn to Google Glass so um, as uh, I'm sure people who are on this hangout know a lot about glass and I don't have to explain too much but uh, for everyone else out there it's a head-mounted computer is more like a pair of eyeglasses and um, there's a video camera, there's a conduction mic, there's um, a processor and you can use it as a computer. Um, the thing we were most interested in doing was using Glass as a device in the emergency department to push data out to a remote provider instead of pulling data in. So we wanted to stream live first-person uh, point of view um, evaluations of patients in the, in the ED to a provider that wasn't in the department. Um, so that's kind of what we did for our toxicology service. Um, the way we did it is uh, we, so one of the problems with glass that, you know, a lot of people have had trouble with is the HIPAA compliance and um, so security issues. 
Um, what, one of the things we did is we worked with a company based in Texas, uh, one of the glass at work companies named called Pristine, and we were able to strip Google Glass of all the Google components, and we put on put in a secure HIPAA compliant backbone, basically allowing encryption of the video stream on the glass end, and then on the user, and then on the back end. Um, the video stream would be decoded in real time and you would see kind of a live image, everything that is um, HIPAA compliant and secure. Um, on the back end, it's simple. It's a Chrome browser uh, with a secure portal that you log into. So we had minimal IT setup from the hospital point of view. So we, <laughs> it was very, very good from an IT perspective in the hospital. Um, so what we did is we basically studied the feasibility if we could actually get the thing to work in a, in a hospital in a busy academic emergency department. Um, and so we took patients who we got called out about um, on our consult service who were, there was a question of some kind of tox emergency. Um, our resident who worked with us on our service, they would go down to the emergency department and see the patient. They would be wearing glass at the same time. and. Um, one of us, one of the fellows, or, or one of our attendings, we would sit in our office and watch the first-person point-of-view video uh, of the interview and the exam. The cool part is that we were able to actually use Glass to securely send um, heads-up text messages to prompt our residents to do specific parts of an exam. Take, um, we were able to take static photos of things like EKGs so we can interpret them, um, and pictures of pill bottles and things like that as well. Um, and then we basically asked our physicians what they thought about it and if you were able to kind of do a good exam virtually. Um, so we found that um, Glass works great. Um, really, we had no problems in terms of an IT and an internet setup. Um, you know, uh, we had one case where we dropped the call and it was mostly because it was in a dead spot in the emergency department. Um, we, we didn't look specifically at changes in management, but anecdotally, almost half the time when we saw a patient um, virtually through glass, we changed what we would have done if compared to if we had only seen them, heard about them through the phone. So um, that kind of poses a lot of really interesting questions for um, us as medical doctors and us as physicians. Um, so, you know, I think this is a really interesting time and an interesting use of some novel technology, um, you know, especially emergency medicine where you could be practicing in a remote setting where you have specialists. This is a great way to bring whoever, um, whoever you want to the bedside with you to help you out with uh, whatever problems or diagnosis you're looking at. So that's that's kind of the premise in the, the study. Um, John, we can probably tweet out or send a link um, to the paper if you want so people can download and read it themselves. And, um, you know, we can uh, explore and see if anyone has any questions or wants to interject or say anything. Hello? Yes, I, I, I wanted to ask, do you have video of any of this that we can uh, see? In the so, uh, no, we, we don't have any video because part of part of getting this through uh, our institutional review board and um, making sure that it was uh, up-to-date and HIPAA compliant was that we were not allowed to record any of the video streams. So the, the iSight software that we use encrypts it on one end and decrypts on the computer end, but it doesn't save any of the... Uh, so we don't have any heads up video. Um, on, on our next um, on our next iteration and the next studies we're looking at, we've actually developed the capability to securely record on the device as well as in the cloud, and we're going to be recording some of our consults. So you know, hopefully, we'd have some video that we can share as long as you know we are, are cognizant of patient privacy. You know, thank you, thank you, Peter. We have Tucker that's joined us, a toxicology uh, fellow from Florida. Hello, Tucker. Tucker's you're muted. That's okay. We'll get back to Tucker later. Okay. One one of the things that uh, that I can tell, uh, actually, uh, the people in the panel and other people is that in the emergency room, as you know, Peter, uh, being an ex-ER doc, we used to have to dig out the PDR. And uh, call poison control. Is is that is that still done now, or those days are gone? 
Well, I think it really depends on where you are. So um, the majority of locations will do that, um, but you know, you're getting a phone console, which uh, I guess one of the questions we have is, can we be better than a phone console or just as good? You know, can we provide some um, kind of extra flavor to the console by doing it through video? Um, you know, a big question we have at our health center is we have a lot of remote hospitals that we work with, and a lot of, right now because based on some phone consults, some things may be unclear, and um, a lot of the times we transfer patients into our academic center so we can just see them, and you know this is potentially a device we can use to you know we'll have to look at it, but we could cut costs by saving on transport time, uh, you know, keeping patients closer to their communities and the hospitals that they're in rather than having to bring them in. You know, given given the fact that most of the nature of these calls to poison control was was simply information, it wasn't revealing patient information. Uh, does that does that have to be HIPAA compliant? Just the information giving on on from the the end of the uh, information giver, or or HIPAA is just it has to be the whole thing has to be compliant. So, so you have to be secure from a streaming perspective because there, there's, there's always concerns that you're, uh, first of all, this is, it's a little bit more than just information because you're now uh, looking at identifiers. So you're okay. looking at a patient's face, you know, oh, okay. they, they. Oh, they, okay. They, okay. Yeah, that's true. I wasn't, like that. even, I wasn't even thinking of the visual aspect. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, we had a hangout uh, last night. We, we had to take the video down because in one of the slides, a patient's face was shown. Yeah, so we, so we, we had to take it down. Yeah, exactly. So in this kind of world of you know these new devices, we have to be really careful. And that that was one thing that we you know it's actually spent probably most a lot of our time on uh, outside of the technology and IT setup was making sure that our patients were protected. So um, you know that's one of the reasons we didn't record video is because you know we we didn't want to have a chance that um, the stream could be uh, intercepted anywhere. Um, and we didn't want a chance that, you know, we could inadvertently, someone could inadvertently take the video or steal it or something like that. So, you know, for, for our IRB and for the purposes of the study, we decided not to do any recording. Sean, do you have any questions of Peter or comments? Um, nothing really. I mean, you know, we're pretty much experiencing the same thing. Uh, we're so restricted with the uh, HIPAA compliance uh, issue. Um, even though like my use with Google Glass uh, where it's not actually uh, towards patient care, it's more like for uh, you know like equipment um, instruction, like equipment user manual, um, information about the medical uh, device or medical uh, supply. But still I was, um, at one point I was uh, halted and was told that oh you gotta you know uh, be mindful about using because the, the thing about you know Google Glass it's just so obvious that it has a camera on its on its I mean, built in on it um, so it, it the, again you know the misconception the uh, people just misunderstood it they don't understand the whole logic or the whole operation of the device that you know it's with any uh, electronic device it still needs a human um, interaction or a human command before it would even take a picture. It doesn't just like randomly take pictures. But um, you know, I respected that, and I don't want to you know really challenge the uh, the status quo. And I just let it down. And uh, you know, obviously, um, I, I, we're in the process of like making them understand. And um, I know I'm I'm aware of pristine uh, what they're doing with the uh, the device, how they're um, gutting it out, and then you know putting uh, like really reinventing the whole device to make it HIPAA compliant um, and then we're I'm, I'm we're, we're doing similar but it's, it's a different process we don't want to take out the whole uh, function of like taking a video but it's more like putting emphasis on you know uh, secure um, uh, like if a user use it we need to identify who's that user so if there's anything you know Goes out, we can trace it back to whoever the uh, the user is. But yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm I would sorry. like to ask uh, Peter: Is there any other department in your hospital that are you know exploring using Google Glass or? No, I mean we our um, our our division our one of our emphasis is on wearable and novel technology. So I actually work 
uh, with a lot of other stuff. So we're not we're not just using glass. We're using Oculus Rift. Uh, we're losing some wrist uh, wearable biosensors, and we're doing uh, we're we're working on engineering some three D environments as well um, that will hopefully in the future all integrate together into uh, emergency care. Um, right now, we are the only people in the hospital using Google Glass. Um, I, I I know I had um, when I was at Brown, we we had uh, spoken with our surgeons about <coughs> using um, the problem with uh, using glass in the OR from a surgical from a surgeon's perspective is that I think the the white light and the bright light in an OR is a little bit too much too overwhelming for the white balance um, to get a very good picture. Uh, right now, I think all the companies out there that are using glass, you know, wearable intelligence, uh, pristine, all these uh, augmetics, all these groups. I think we've kind of pushed glass to the limit at this point. You know, we're, we're at this point are limited by the hardware that Google has given us. Um, so um, I, I, we, we had talked with Google X about um, developing some new hardware and um, hopefully, you know, glass version 2.0, is, it's on the books and it's being made. and. Uh, hopefully that'll come out soon so that we can use it and I think it's going to solve a lot of the problems that we have right now. Um, in terms of a security perspective, I know you, John you were saying you had some problems, you know, um, the nice part about using a, a group like Pristine and um, having some developers on hand is that we were able to show the code to our IT experts and our security experts and, you know, we followed the the rules of HIPAA to the to the line with all the the code that we that was written for us, and so you know our our hospital actually was very didn't really have too many problems about letting us use it. Um, you know some of the questions that you know if you're a physician or whoever thinking about um, working on this is you know there there's other things that are wireless in, in a hospital that are important. For example, things we don't think about. So for example, insulin, uh, uh, glucometers, and um, IV pumps, you know, all those things um, do have some wireless interface. So um, you have to be sure that the ports that the glass unit is using are restricted just to glass. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, video interference and lag. So we did a lot of experimenting with figuring out which ports that we could keep open and reserve for glass in the hospital. Um, and at times we ended up whitelisting the device so it would get priority, so we could get a clear video stream. But um, it all worked out. I mean, we've done it at two separate um, big institutions. We've done it at Brown and we've done it at UMass, and uh, we've had similar results. So you know, I think that hopefully this will be something that we can use in the future, um, especially with a new version coming out. Uh, Peter, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you: Can you compare? Like using uh, Google Glass to, you know, Google Glass has very similar capabilities to a smartphone, mm -hmm. uh, but the smartphone is, you know, it's it's common now. While Google Glass is, it, it seems to be like another device to have, but it does have its own perspective. It does have the image overlay. You don't have to hold it, or control it. Can you give me? Can you t talk about that? How like you know, is is it superior? To using a smartphone, uh, to uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I think it's different. So you know, if you're using FaceTime on your phone or something like that, remember that's not actually secure, nor is that HIPAA compliant. So I mean, there there are platforms that make a smartphone secure and compliant that you can use in a hospital and healthcare setting. Um, but uh, that's kind of one thing to keep in mind. The second part is that if you're using a smartphone, you got to hold it with a hand. Um, you know. Sometimes, in, when you're busy doing something, you know that you need you need that hand. So, um, for example, if you were a ER doc remotely and you're um, seeing a sick trauma patient, you're putting in a chest tube and you want your trauma surgeon to watch you and see the patient while you're doing it. You can't really hold a smartphone while you're doing a procedure that needs two hands. So, um, the hands-free aspect of it, I think, is very appealing, especially in emergency medicine. Um, the the other part that uh, I thought was Pretty interesting is in our, in our JAMA paper, um, we actually talked to our patients and we asked them what they thought about the use of glass. Um, and um, patients overwhelmingly said that they liked glass. You know, we this is a time where we're having a lot of people talking about how there's um, privacy issues with glass and how people are worried they're being recorded. But when we talk to our patients. Um, you know that we use glass with they they actually liked it because they they thought that they were kind of getting involved in their decision making a little bit better because they could see us having a conversation we were able to relay the information that we were hearing from our consultants to the patient right there in real time and 
um, you know, they could tell us, you know, no, I've already tried that, or you know, that appointment date doesn't really work for me. So um, they were, we were able to really um, get the patients more involved. So I think those are kind of two really interesting, exciting aspects of glass that you know we're going to explore in the future. Well, I, I guess that kind of answered my question. I was going to ask them about communication with patients in the field, but I guess that's that's totally out. Like like you know, if someone's having a picnic out in the woods, and they and they call call the hospital. There's no possibility of them using a smartphone to to kind of transmit the uh, image of the possibly poisoned patient. Well, I mean, you, you could. Uh, the, I mean, the problem is if you're sending if you're sending a text message, and you know, you could send it to any any number by mistake, yeah. and it's, it's not going to be a secure thing if you're sending a you know a picture of a right. snake bite or something that's identified. So, um, you know, that that's why we liked glass. We we like the hands free aspect of it as well. Okay, very good. And Fred, do you have any questions? Fred or or Phil or Tucker, if you can hear me. Um, I've been taking, this is Phil, I'm ta I've been taking a few notes. I actually will formulate some questions. How do we get questions back to Dr. Chai, uh, like if I have them tomorrow? Can I email them to you, Dr. John? Well, yeah, uh, I'll give you, I can uh -huh. give, I'll give you his email address if, with Peter's permission, of course. Yeah, okay. you, can, you can do that. Or, um, you know, we're, we're all on Twitter, so you can always uh, tweet us as well. Um, okay. I guess that works as well. Okay, very good. Fred, you're quiet over there. Yeah, because it's early here. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering um, what advantage um, can this uh, Google Glass bring as well in uh, terms of uh, the Da Vinci robot systems and stuff? Because I've been working with Da Vinci robots lately. Um, it's really amazing. It gives uh, a great 3D um, image and sound as well. Of course, it's it's a multi-million uh, investment and 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 not of another um, not much um, disciplines are able to use it. But maybe um, it can be upgraded by the use of Google Glass. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't really know. I mean, you know, you're really using glass to get a heads-up view. So I guess if you were um, you know, not there at the scene, you know, it sounds like more for educational purposes you could have someone watch you or kind of watch your tan technique and I think that's probably what John's working on in, in the OR, you know, we, we, we were exploring at some time, some of our surgeons were interested in putting glass on our surgical residents and um, watching how many times they looked away from the field to see if you can help them manage their instruments and things, so, you know, that might be a possibility, but uh, you do bring up a good point about cost. So, um, you know, the, the cost of glass is actually not too bad. So depending on which company you use, most are done through a subscription basis right now because you can't commercially buy the units. Um, so the subscription basis is actually relatively cheap when you think about it compared to a traditional telemedicine card, uh, especially because there's very minimal IT backbone. So um, if you're talking to um, your hospital or your healthcare facility where you want to use glass, it's actually a pretty easy thing to set up from an uh, IT backbone perspective. Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome. And any more questions, gentlemen? I'm trying to unmute Tucker here. Okay, Tucker, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, finally, Tucker. Meet, meet Peter, the other toxicology fellow. This is Tucker, yeah. toxicology fellow from Drexel and now in Florida. Yeah, something, something along those lines. Yeah. Anyway, but here's my question. Like, in terms of patient, what is what is the intent of this thing? I'm, I'm glad you got a paper in JAMA for it, but, but what is this going to do to help patient care for the average Joe Blow who's not a toxicologist, who's not going to be on site? Who's, you know, how, how, tell me how this is going to help. I, I just want to understand it, that's all. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the things this can do is it can, you, you know, it, it allows the specialist to not have to go on site, you know, hopefully in the future you can see someone remotely. Um, the, the other part is that if you're, if you're a single practice uh, physician um, and say you're covering three or four sites, you know, instead of 
you know, having to drive to each site. Now you're you're on your iPad at home or you're, you know, on your iPhone while you're out and you're able to kind of access patients at each site. You're able to remotely see them, you know, through the eyes of your um, the eyes of the consulting physician. So I think that's where the benefit's going to be. Um, you know, the, the other thing is for, you know, for us as toxicologists, you know, um, if you're going to end up being consulted on a patient in a remote setting where, you know, they're far away and you're not going to be able to get to them, yeah, we're, we're still trying to figure this out, but there, there may be parts of the visual and kind of the part of you virtually being there that may be helpful for the consulting physician on the other end. Other the poison control and, and how oh, how ahead. does it sorry, how does sorry. it benefit how does it benefit over the sorry how does it benefit over by calling up on a phone or like you said on a smartphone or whatever like, well, that's, not, that's not hyper compliant yeah I mean I I think talking to so, so that's a good question I mean I I think um, we, we're not sure exactly how much better this is going to be. Um, what, you know, what we know is that you know we've been, doing, yeah, I know we've been doing phone consults for ages, um, but you know, I, 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 I'm sure you've had experience where you, you're like, I don't really know what it means when you tell me that somebody's altered or someone's confused, or do they truly have, you know, increased reflexes, or do they truly have clonus? And you know, we've we've seen even in our academics that are just virtually being at the bedside, we're able to kind of elucidate some of those things and kind of make sense of it and some of the kind of more subtle parts of the exam. Uh, so, you know, if you correlate it out to other special groups who are reliant on um, a visual exam, you know, that, that may be something that would be helpful. I got you. Thank you for answering the question. Sorry to take so much time. Yeah, no problem. Tucker, thanks for coming. Uh, okay, okay, I Peter, really appreciate any, it. More, Thanks, Peter. Any, more, any more questions from the panel? Okay, very good. We'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, and for the panelists for coming out. Uh, and uh, we're going to have another hangout tomorrow night. Um, and uh, we hope you all join us at 9 o'clock. So, good evening, gentlemen. Stick around. We'll chat. Thank you.